here that she had beautiful studio visits. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce her. Um, Karen will talk for some time and then um, she will open a discussion. So anyone who wants to participate, say something, um, is invited to turn their camera on. Um, you can write to me in the chat so I will call on you to speak uh, so that we don't so like a stack thing, if everybody is familiar. Um, Karen Wong is the deputy director of the new museum, renowned for its entrepreneurial platforms and mission, new art and new ideas. She co-founded Idea City, a Malibu program exploring the future of cities with the belief that art and culture are essential to our metropolis. New Inc the first museum-led incubator for art, technology, and design, and ONX Studio, a mixed reality accelerator and exhibition space. These game-changing programs elevate creative practitioners and demonstrate the art's transformative power for cultural and social impact. Wong sits on the nonprofit boards of Apex for Youth, a mentoring and education program for underserved Asians, Arbutus, David Burns Foundation focused on performance-based education projects, National Sawdust, a new music performance venue, and Rizom, a platform for born digital art. Um, Karen, this is an honor to um, give the mic to you now. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm just so delighted to be here. And I just want to shout out Simon, Paulina, Cajun, Maya, and Leo uh, yesterday for visiting with me. As I said to them individually, it was inspiring, it was thrilling. Uh, and just to see so much passion, uh, skillful, and thoughtful work uh, that is highly, highly relevant. Uh, what I thought I would do today is I'm going to crash through very quickly um, uh, a set of slides which really kind of um, talks about some of the ideas I'm interested in right now. Uh, and then I thought we'd try to leave at least uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes for conversation. Uh, I used to teach over at GSAP at Columbia, and I really um, enjoy doing things that feel more like a workshop, more like a dialogue. So hopefully everyone will, will join me in that in about 30 minutes. I'm gonna screen share. And we will. So I think, you know, oftentimes I get this question about what do I really do at the new museum as the deputy director, but before I get there, I just thought um, I'd give a, a, a quick um, history lesson of the generations, uh, baby boomers, uh, Wall Street. I think uh, the idea was capitalism and trying to crash through glass ceilings. Uh, Gen X, which is the generation I belong to, it's always been about the meandering journey, um, quite typified in this trilogy um, of Ethan Hawke and Julia Delpy. And then um, Gen X has been so, certainly a, uh, a moment where we're very interested in our heroes and what our superpowers are. And Oftentimes the millennial generation is the slash generation, right? You can be an artist, coder, slash chef, slash healer, slash DJ, slash, slash, slash. Um, and though in one way I'm making fun of it, in another way I'm incredibly envious in terms of the fluidity and the seamlessness with which uh, this generation has been able to move uh, from you know, one discipline to another or one thought to another. So um, this is a quick diagram of my last 
30 years as a professional. And I think at heart, I'm a millennial, but because I came up through Gen X, my <laughs> trajectory has been very linear. Um, started off um, in Boston after graduating from college uh, in Providence, Rhode Island as a gallerina. I moved quickly into the nonprofit space and worked for City Year, which was um, an organization, uh, one of the leaders in um, public service. Uh, and after doing that for a year and primarily working on their design, I established uh, my own studio designing specifically for nonprofits and social causes called Habamok Design. Um, and then after wrapping that up in six years where um, certainly it was a great chapter in Boston where uh, nonprofits uh, play such a huge role in that city. Uh, I had an early midlife crisis as well as um, got divorced. And so I shifted my whole being to London and ended up working with a friend, uh, David Ajay, and helped him start his architectural practice. Um, you know, two decades later, I think most of you know him as Sir David Ajay, a very prominent architect and certainly someone who's uh, broken a number of ceilings. And in 2006, I became a museum professional at the New Museum, and I've had a very long chapter there for 15 years. And over the last, uh, I guess, 10 years, I've been very interested in volunteer work as a board member for a number of organizations. And then subsequently, several years ago, I started teaching. Um, one of the terms that I'm really fascinated by is long tail. Um, and I think most of you probably have heard of this concept, which was kind of encapsulated uh, by Chris Anderson, who uh, kind of kicked it back in 2004 in a Wired article. Um, his argument really addressed the status quo in which in vogue products and books that sell well in the short amount of time can ultimately be outpaced by less popular items over an extended period. Um, so if you plot this on a graph, you know, the vertical axis represents sales and the horizontal axis is popularity. Um, you understand actually why Amazon um, has been so successful because it is based on this notion of the long tail. And so if there's this idea where you replace um, the sales with cultural impact and you use a similar logic, uh, that there's this premise that would suggest that though we often get super excited by this notion of what is a blockbuster, I would argue that um, we as artists and cultural producers um, should also understand that these niche experiences over a longer term can just be as um, as as important uh, as as engaging, as relevant uh, over a longer set of time. Um, what you see here on the left-hand side is uh, a performative piece uh, called Say Something Bunny that happened about four years ago. It was this experimental immersive theater. You know, It was only supposed to be up for a couple of months and only 24 people could participate at a time. Uh, it did so well that it ended up running for more than a, a year. So. Uh, just this notion around what is um, a long tail idea. Um, amplification versus invention. Uh, there's a lot of talk around how is technology being used in museums? And typically this is what you see. Um, I think uh, many of the museums here in New York City are on the bleeding edge of what it means to amplify their collections and their exhibitions. Uh, this one, of course, uh, using um, a, a kind of augmented reality. Um, and we like to say at the new museum that we're less about amplification and more about invention, where we always let the artists take the lead. Um, in 2015, in Lauren Cornell's Triennial, um, I believe we were the first museum to 
uh, use a VR headset in an installation. And this is Daniel Stiegman's Phantom, where essentially you were transported into a Brazilian rainforest. Um, in this case, um, several years later, we had our blockbuster show, Pepilati Wrist, um, who created uh, a number of installations uh, which just uh, embodied this kind of seamlessness around how an artist imbues their work with, um, uh, with tech, but it's not about the technology. And then uh, this one um, more recent is Alexandra Parizzi from Bucharest, who, again, I think we were one of the first museums to use a life-size hologram that um, participated and was choreographed with a set of um, real characters of dancers and singers who performed in the space with the hologram. Um, we've also been very interested in trying to figure out what does VR mean to a museum space. And again, about four years ago with Rhizome, we, cre we created um, this app um, where you could experience VR on your phone. And, uh, you know, I had kind of a, a, a great range of projects from a number of artists. This one is Jeremy Couillard, uh, Rachel Rawson, who's gotten a lot of notice lately. Um, and this one by Rindon Johnson, um, fairly recent work as well. But this is what you had to um, use when we debuted it uh, four or five years ago. Um, it was the cardboard headset. Um, we convinced Google to give us about um, a thousand of these. We sent them out to uh, members of the new museum and Quite frankly, it just never took off. I think we were a little bit before our time. Uh, and I think, you know, adoption for VR has still been very slow. I think, you know, the equipment, the tech just isn't quite there yet for mass adoption, but, you know, billions of dollars are being poured into both AR and VR. So it's something that I always share with um, students that uh, they should always be, um, understanding, even if you're not interested, you need to understand these two mediums because they certainly can become dominant in the next five to 10 years. Um, when the new museum turned 40, um, one of the major partnerships I brought in early on in 2007 was to make nice with um, a small ad agency at that point called Droga 5. There were about 40 people at that point. They had done this great kind of echo campaign uh, that, was, that went viral. I was very interested in working with an ad agency that was um, not typical for museums. And so over this 15 year tenure, um, they have every three or four years done something quite major for us pro bono. And, in our 40th anniversary, I guess this was three or four years ago, um, they proposed what they called a uh, new museum live, see art that's happening now. Um, and it was kind of insane. Um, what it was is that they built this application which live streamed the um, show that we had on that time, which was the triennial, which is um, Trigger um, curated by Johanna Burton. And what you could do on this app is move through the museum and see what was happening live. Um, and the way it was broadcasted was you could experience it on your phone, but um, there were other uh, kind of platforms which donated uh, their uh, media, which then allowed us to stream into these very odd places like Times Square, in coffee shops, on buses. And, this, you get a good sense of the number of cameras that we installed um, around this particular show. And you could literally go onto the app and, and watch it 24 seven. I think it's quite prescient given that this was done three, four years ago and subsequently what happened our pandemic. Uh, you know, we've really been trying to understand how can you experience um, exhibitions in a digital manner and certainly this was, again, a little bit before its time. It was a quote unquote marketing campaign 
Um, yet at the same time, certainly we tried to do something digitally with physical space. And speaking of physical spaces and digital experiences, um, I often show this slide, which is Minority Report. Um, if anybody wants to take a guess of when this actually came out, this was 2002, so 20 years ago, two decades ago. Um, and yet uh, the type of technology uh, that Minority Report with um, their production designer, Alex McDowell was imagining uh, still is, is quite far behind where we are today. Um, this is uh, at Tribeca Festival maybe two, three years ago in terms of the type of uh, VR that we're using right now and the kind of spaces uh, that are used for presenting VR. Uh, this is another image of uh, another, another VR work which tries to create a little bit more of a set design in a beauty parlor. And then this crazily enough is in um, Venice where they were showing you know, major VR works by blue chip artists. And yet this was the kind of installation that um, they equipped for these works. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have this huge arc of what is being done by those who have a lot of um, money and power. So Super Blue, as some of you may have heard, is opening up in, or has opened up in Miami. This is backed by Pace Gallery. Apparently they intend to roll out these kind of art and tech spaces all across the United States or at least in uh, two or three more cities. Um, I think this is a team lab that comes out of Tokyo creating these quote unquote immersive environments. And then um, some of you may have also heard of Mal Wolf. Uh, again, this notion of creating immersive environments uh, that have a, a real kind of spectacle notion to them. Uh, and, you know, they are very, very popular. Um, and they come with high ticket prices. So what is that in between space? Where can we make work? Where can we support um, extended reality artists who want to make weird, socially impactful, culturally impactful works that, you know, not everybody is going to uh, want to see because it's a niche piece of work. Uh, we started Onyx Studio with Onassis Foundation, which was opened during the middle of the pandemic uh, in October of 2020. Uh, the idea is to support about a dozen full-time mixed reality artists. And uh, we created a space that's approximately about two and a half, 3,000 square feet. That's very flexible. It's both workspace as well as a production studio, uh, has a number of configurations. These are just some images uh, that we took actually before uh, the members moved in. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, the space hasn't been really um, used the way we had imagined. We do expect it to kind of be where it, we hope to be um, in, in September, October, when everybody uh, comes back into real space. Uh, but in the meantime, we do plan to do a showcase over the next couple of weeks, kicking off uh, next Wednesday as part of Tribeca Festival. And this is just a teaser. I'm going to send a link to everybody and hopefully you guys will be able to come and uh, check check that out. Uh, what I'm quite interested in with the Onyx Studio 
is really trying to figure out how we can present work that is in between exhibition and performance. I think that is where extended reality is going. Uh, the kind of spaces that Sundance and Tribeca Festival have created typically feel very much like science fair. You go from booth to booth. And it would be really interesting if we can dismantle um, that and try to create these new hybrid spaces. And so um, that's what we're hoping for at Onyx Studio. So I do encourage everyone to, to pop in uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, architectural spectacle. Um, I think most of you guys uh, know that I have um, a very sincere and passionate interest in architecture. And I just want to show a quick series of images around um, spectacle and museum um, making. And of course, this is the, the Met uh, in itself, just its sheer size feels like a spectacle. Um, the Guggenheim, very hermetic, but a spectacle. Uh, the Bilbao, which was probably the height of what we would call um, architectural gymnastics. Uh, this is Crystal Bridges um, uh, that the Walton family uh, built um, about 10 years ago in Arkansas uh, by Moshi Safdi. Uh, this is a Herzog and Dumeron Museum that is being built in Berlin. The Shed, uh, which opened just a couple of years ago. And certainly uh, the new museum is not immune. This is um, a nighttime shot, uh, which is probably three years away with the second building that the museum is uh, launching, uh, designed by OMA, uh, Rem Kohlhaus and Shohei Shigematsu. So how do you design inclusion? Um, so a quick case study right here is Idea City. As mentioned in my bio, uh, Idea City really started out as a community festival in downtown New York. Uh, it has since kind of morphed and transformed uh, as needed uh, and also based on the sister city that has welcomed us into uh, their community. Uh, but back in 2017, we were really asking questions around what is citizen engagement? What is public space? Uh, how can you create um, something that is adaptable and truly flexible? And so uh, for um, years since 2011, uh, every couple of years we pop up uh, in our neighborhood. And in this case, we went to uh, the Sarah D. Roosevelt Park um, right at Christie Street. And we took over uh, this set of basketball courts with this kind of th quote unquote three ring circus for us. And what we were really interested in was creating a different modality of how we could interact with one another. Uh, and the three rings were called the marketplace, which you see here is a marketplace of ideas. Uh, this was the assembly, which so it was kind of a larger circle where you know several hundred people could gather to listen to talks. And then, um, unfortunately, it looks like I'm missing half the picture here, but this was a, 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 a third ring, which we called our studio space, so for more intimate talks. Um, this was a stage on the left hand, you see John Gray from Ghetto Gastro. On the right hand side are three mayors. And what I really wanted to point out here architecturally is the kind of stage, non-stage. I think, you know, one thing that I've learned, um, one of my biggest takeaways when we talk about how you design spaces for conferences is the notion around the stage and that uh, how politicized the stage has become, uh, how hard I hierarchical the stage has become. And so even in 2017, we were sensing that. So very deliberate that this stage is actually part of the ring, that it is only about a foot off of the ground plane so that uh, folks are really looking at people at eye level. And uh, this were the folks uh, that were curated or organized as the main speakers in 2017 and again, Idea City was a reflection 
around how you can organize a conference that reflects uh, the population of New York City uh, before DEI task force became such a buzzword over the last year. And this is a drone shot of what Idea City uh, looked like. Uh, designing cultural and economic impact, uh, New Inc. Um, New Inc. is the first museum-led cultural incubator at the, art, at the intersection of art design and technology. I'm actually here before you today because NOAA was um, an early member. And so we had um, a friendship and I'm very excited that she uh, did bring me forward this year to meet with um, the, the Hunter MFA students. Um, you know, everyone seven years ago thought we were crazy for starting an incubator. They had, folks didn't understand why a museum was interested in um, incubation. And our remark was, well, you know, as a museum for contemporary art, we've been incubating um, artists, um, how to make exhibitions, incubating curators. Uh, there's no reason for us not to create something that's more formal and to, in many ways, expand this notion of what an artist is, given that our remit is new art, new ideas. So I had typically focused more on the new ideas and uh, New Inc. certainly is an example of that. So just to give you a quick brief review, you know, you can take a look at our stats as well as what the backbone of our work is about. Um, every year we kick off the um, our camp where we take the entire community and we decide what the values of the community will be together. And subsequently, um, what we're really proud of is that we're an incubator space where we're 49% women and gender nonconforming and 50% people of color. I think uh, something that is not told very often is that uh, the folks at New Inc. have been successful. They've created over 550 jobs and there's been um, quite a bit of money raised. And um, just quickly moving uh, through some of the folks who go through um, New Inc, uh, movers and shakers who are uh, using an AR tool to understand what black and brown monuments uh, could look like um, in digital space and understand what a type of curriculum could be for um, uh, public schools. Uh, studio Elsewhere, Morel Phillips, she designed it um, again, a immersive space to really combat the kind of fatigue and stress for frontline workers in hospitals. She paired up with Mount Sinai and um, a one uh, of these immersive frontline worker lounges became 12 very quickly throughout the entire system uh, where doctors were saying that even 20 minutes uh, of being in this space uh, made them uh, feel uh, like 80, 90% better. So the, the stats on this are incredible. Uh, one of my favorites, Scope of Work, it's a talent development agency started by these two women. And um, as I think most of you will know, if you look at the stats around architecture, around graphic design, around ad agencies, the number of uh, BIPOC young people involved is incredibly low, one, two, three percent. And so they're really focused on uh, developing a pipeline by uh, making sure they understand what portfolio, portfolio reviews mean, um, how to interview, how to present yourself so you can become part of this um, ecosystem. And uh, going back to this idea of the spectacle of museums, here we had a group called Micro where they wanted to decentralize uh, the model and created this subscription of kiosks uh, that could be distributed across the nation. Um, and it's about to roll out in uh, some major airports. So it's um, accessible, it's free to all, uh, and it's uh, perhaps one of the most exciting projects that's come out of New Inc. over the last several years. And then finally, um, I wanted to remind everybody that Grief and Grievance, uh, the show that we've had on for the last six months, it's very last weekend, is this weekend, and we are free the entire weekend. So uh, just sign up for tickets. Uh, Grief and Grievance Art Morning in America at the New Museum. And I will end there. Um, 
And I'm hoping folks will now um, maybe share their screen or turn on their video so we can see each other um, and would love to um, have a conversation and answer any questions. I think folks know that I'm pretty transparent uh, or I do my best to in my set of circumstances. Uh, I know I threw a lot out there. And as I said, it hopefully ties together a little bit about what I actually do as the deputy director of the new museum. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting portfolio. I feel very fortunate. It's not the typical work that um, deputy directors do at other museums. Uh, so it's uh, in, in many ways something that I carved out for myself over the last decade uh, in terms of some of the things I wanted to see in museum spaces. So certainly um, uh, happy to answer anything around the museum, around our current exhibition. Hi, I have a question for you. Um, great talk, thank you. Uh, that was very informative. And I'm wondering, um, what do you think about the NFT craze and if there's any space for them in museums going forward? I just think you'd have interesting thoughts about this. Thanks. Good question. Um, it seems to be the hottest topic of the last um, uh, three months. And, um, and I guess I have my foot in um, both sides uh, only to say, you know, I think at first when people talked about NFTs, there was this craze about how it was going to be disruptive and it was going to kind of change the entire art world landscape. And very early on, I was just like, no way. I said, it's not going to change anything, but certainly it will expand the conversation. And I think if we focus on this idea that is expanding the conversation, that is what is most interesting. Um, what I found not only interesting, but really around this notion of possible representation, uh, though, you know, quite frankly, who makes NFTs, I'm quite sure still skewers very much white and male. But what it demonstrated and what it said to me is that an entirely new set of artists and makers with an entirely new set of quote unquote buyers and collectors can exist outside of this current art world ecosystem that the new museum, that Hunter College is part of. Um, I think artists who are quote unquote part of the art world are treading very carefully, very lightly. Uh, and I think we will expect to see uh, some of them moving into the NFT spaces. I think uh, some contemporary Kunsthallers already are trying to get onto the bandwagon and uh, looking to curate NFT exhibitions. Um, but again, you know, right now we're so engaged in the notion of uh, how much money anybody can make from the MFT. And I hope that it will die down and we will start talking about this idea around uh, the NFT or really around digital being the medium. And if it is truly a medium, uh, which of course we've seen, um, you know, digital art since the 60s, but you know, it's always been kind of this stop, start, stop, start. And certainly Rhizome has been such a major leader in uh, kind of framing that conversation. But you know, it would, it would be really exciting to understand over the next year or two if digital as a medium really takes off in terms of being able to uh, express a type of new kind of art that we don't understand quite yet. Um, you know, something that is not a mem and not a gif and you know, not TikTok. I think there's something out there and I'm just so excited to see um, once people um, kind of get out of the hype and we start looking at it really as, as a medium for, for storytelling. Um, do you guys 
see a lot of your peers testing out the MFT as um, as a space of um, artistic practice right now, or is it just um, kind of a dabbling or curiosity? Anybody want to just jump in? I think there's a small enough group here. We can just. I've seen, I've seen both. I've seen um, people. So the guy Beeple who made the, the big money um, NFT. Yes. Um, I have a design background and he used to do lots of free tutorials for people who are interested in making 3D work. Right? So he's basically like a 3D guy who gave away a ton of stuff for a long time. If you wanted to learn how to use Cinema 4D or some software, you could watch his videos on YouTube for free. So I'm kind of happy for him that after like, you know, 20 years of doing these free tutorials, he made some money because, you know, corporations are definitely benefiting from it. Like, you know, people would use his things and then like sell it in a Nike ad or whatever. Um, so good for him. Um, and so I've seen a lot of the design community trying to rush in based on his success. And then I've seen on the art community, the light treading because of the fear of the fact that it is such a commercially driven sort of money-based blockchain, all that stuff. So, but I've seen people do it thoughtfully. So I think there's like a chance that if it's not sort of driven by like being viral or being, you know, that, that just being like a, a thing of the moment, there are some interesting things in there, like the contracts and reselling is interesting to me that there's that sort of built in from what I understand that you can have a contract where you are paid or you have some sort of residuals of some sorts for reselling, which I think is an issue. I've heard Kerry James Marshall talk about, you know, like selling work for nothing and then, you know, yeah. five, 10 years later, it's like been flipped so many times and worth so much money. So the fact that there is some transparency there, I think is interesting um, on the money side. And there's, it's as a digital platform, I think it's interesting too. But um, yeah, right now it seems like a lot of hype primarily, but I'd be interested in hearing how other people think about the idea of like this residuals or the sort of transparency that opens up with blockchain. Well, I think that's one of the most exciting components around this. It's it's really around the um, the idea of independence for artists. It's around this notion of being able to capture the value um, as um, artist careers. Uh, become more prominent because it is the only cultural field that I know where if you, uh, you know, sell something uh, when you're 22, when you're 55, you don't get to cash in. While, you know, most music writers, anybody who writes a book, uh, because it's based on a royalty system and it's a different kind of object, uh, you know, you can still be making money off your first book well into retirement. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm excited, Simon, that you you brought that brought that up. Um, I'm going to quickly go to another question, which came up in the chat, um, which is, can you speak about the next triennial and the curatorial process pertaining to it? Uh, so yes, uh, I think it's called soft water, hard stone, hard water, soft stone, um, which opens uh, late October, curated by Margot Norton and a guest curator, Jamila James from the ICA Los Angeles. Uh, we're, we're thrilled um, and super excited. I think you can find the artist list on our website already because we announced, um, oh no, did we? I think we announced the dates and the title. I don't know if we announced the artist yet that usually that that probably comes out a couple of, couple of months beforehand. Um, with regards to the process, um, again, I think um, what makes the new museum pretty special is 
uh, once a curator has been given an assignment, uh, it's really for theirs to run and develop the thesis. So certainly there were a number of conversations between uh, Jamila and Margot, uh, and I think quite frankly, uh, you know, oftentimes a thesis doesn't emerge until about year two of research. Typically, you know, um, the triennials are every three years. So certainly, you know, you're going to curate a show uh, three years in, in, in advance. Um, I think trying to design um, and organize a triennial when one of your years was taken up by um, COVID uh, has been uh, really intense. Um, but they have also said maybe the silver lining was being able to do everything by Zoom. They actually ended up being able to see many more artists in many more cities around the world. So I think what we'll see is perhaps one of the most diverse geographically as well as ethnically. Um, so, um, so TBD, I hope everyone comes and, and checks that out, as I said, end of October. Um, I don't have that much more insight around the curatorial process. If you're asking how to get in front of curators, which I know a lot of um, artists um, and students always ask me, um, you know, it's just a combination of, of luck and um, being able to present your work at the right time at the right place. Uh, you know, I, I would, I hate to say this, but certainly I, I still feel um, in our art world, it's, it's often based on who you know and what school you went to. And, and certainly going to a prestigious school at Hunter should give everybody here a leg up. Um, but yes, I, I, I find it um, myself quite mysterious in terms of um, how each curator uh, develops their practice and their network of artists that they're interested in. And, and certainly, um, you know, a tremendous amount of research goes, goes into it. And one of the things that um, I am interested in is how do, you, how do you create platforms so more artists who don't have gallery or museum representation can present their work to the largest group of people? Um, so something on my mind, I haven't solved it yet, but um, maybe I will. At some, at some later date. Any other, any other burning questions, Noah? Yeah. yeah. Hey, good to see you. Um, I remember a while ago we had some conversations about fashion and art and technology and how they connect. And also today you talked about the slash 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 of being this and that. Um, and then the MoMA last year or two years ago did like this shuffling thing about their collection and now they're showing like sometimes even fashion next to contemporary art. Um, but still like most museums do separate their exhibitions or their objects into categories. Um, I think the new museum too. So I'm curious what your take about it and how do you see design and art, um, the distinction or integration? You know, my um, evolution around hybridity has been, um, to be quite frank, uh, really informed by the people who came through New Inc. Certainly conceptually, I bought into this idea of hybridity a long time ago. Um, but because, you know, you, you are in museum spaces, which, as you say, um, define um, objects into categories. You are in schools where it used to be that it was the photography department, the sculpture department, new media department, painting. I mean, even the way we're taught where how we're educated is that these things are all separate disciplines. And at New Inc, I'm, I'm really, really excited about anything that we call the blur. And I, and certainly I, I saw it in some of the practices that were happening um, yesterday. I think in particular, um, just very interested in what Leo is trying to achieve in terms of making moving images, try, trying to create something immersive. Uh, there was obviously architectural elements in that as well. Um, and I'm, 
I think personally, that is where art is going. I think that's where cultural production is going. And I really believe it is the millennials and the Gen Zs who will break down these kind of invisible barriers uh, that don't need to exist. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that um, there will be um, more spaces who are going to be open to um, artists with what I'm calling a, a, a small A versus a capital A uh, in, in, in welcoming, them, welcoming them into these quote unquote um, sacred spaces of um, how art has been defined. And, and I think we see it, we see it. It's, we all know museums move at a slow pace, um, but it, it's happening. It's, it's gradually happening, just as you said, you know, that, that was a major move for MoMA. And, um, you know, something next will come up and they will make another major move. And, uh, and then hopefully pretty soon we'll uh, see much weirder poetic works. And I think performance, quite frankly, is uh, moving into it much quicker than the visual arts. I see them really collapsing and, you know, we're, we're oftentimes now being invited to these things which, you know, you don't really know what to call it. And certainly, you know, Rosalie Goldberg and Performer, a performer were again, you know, very on the cuts of some of that that was happening. I'm very suspicious of things like Super Blue and um, Mal Wolf who, you know, talk a lot about being hybrid and between art and tech, but uh, they feel very much like, um, uh, environments made specifically for Instagram. So, you know, I, I'm a little bit dubious about where that where that's all going, but um, we'll see. Um, question from Lauren is, I hear you're thinking deeply about how museums and art institutions can support and incubate new ideas and support new voices. Could you talk a bit about how you understand the museum's responsibility to the people who work for it, thinking specifically about the push towards unionizing and has been reverberating throughout the world and the museum's resistance to labor organizing. Thank you for the question. Um, I think um, a misconception, which you know certainly was perpetuated by the media and social media is that we resisted labor organization. We certainly took it to a vote, but as soon as we uh, had a union, Another thing that the media did not cover is we were one of the fastest uh, museums to come to a contract. I think most of you probably know that the New Yorker after three years still does not have a contract. We had our contract in eight months. And certainly one of the things we have been trying to do uh, on both sides, both the union staff as well as management, uh, we've been developing a lot of things where we're much more transparent. We are having a ton more of different kinds of workshops and staff meetings. And, you know, again, this is very hard over Zoom, but we've been able to do it. And um, it's been something that I think we're pretty proud that we've been able to uh, really come to a place where we're a museum that is um, very appreciative of uh, the union and how we have transformed over the last couple of years. Anyone else? We are kind of getting close to the end of our time. So this is a great moment to ask some more questions. No. I guess one, one question I'd like to throw back at, at um, you all is really around this notion when we spoke originally around the NFTs and folks talked about it being too commercial. What does it mean to be too commercial as an artist right now? Well, I can say like I am kind of dipping into the NFT conversation a little bit right now. And I do think there are a lot of opportunities like. Um, ah, yeah, I'm working um, with uh, like artists it's an art space and like thinking about uh new conversations around nfts so i think the commercial aspect of art is really interesting in terms of like um yeah what it means to be too commercial um as in like part of a market i think really you know but also like i think that's such like a weird 
conversation and I really thank you for this talk about hybridity because I think when it comes to like technology and spaces um, like that, um, the conversation around commercial uh, takes like a different form than it does around surrounding like, uh, than like say like painting or like sculpture, which also exists in a very commercial way. So thank you. We have another question from Mikhail. Yes, so given the high volume of F MFA level graduates entering the art labor market each year, do you think the current commercial gallery system is adequate enough? Um, probably not. <laughs> I mean, one of the things, the reason why New Ink was developed is, you know, what I saw in New York City is that we had a number of uh, designers and artists who were interested in this space, but there was no um, professional development, no way to kind of even share with people who are interested in this, you know, what is the difference between copyright and trademarking and what's the difference between, um, you know, this type of contract versus another? Uh, how do you actually um, make a deck so that you can um, hopefully ask for money or, you know, just really basic questions in terms of sustainability. And I think this is often the question, which is um, artists, be it undergrad or MFA programs, um, you know, right now we've been really socialized and taught that, you know, that the premier system is the gallery system. Um, yet at the same time, you know, uh, if you look who runs galleries, um, you know, there, there, there's all kinds of barriers to entry. Uh, and so certainly I'm, I'm hoping with this notion around what's happening in the NFT world, you know, can we transfer some of that energy into finding other kinds of systems that can be available to artists or, you know, do artists have to, you know, invent something for themselves? So a uh, big, huge question. Uh, and, and again, as I said, something that, um, that I've been thinking a lot about over the last, um, last five years. I want to jump in again about um, this sort of like physical space and then the NFT world. I mean, I think all of us for the past year, having all of our classes on Zoom has also been a really interesting switch for a lot of us and having like visual critiques of our work on a screen. I think that's like a place where, I don't know, I never had thought of that I would be there and we were all there. And I think that's sort of like an interesting stepping stone maybe into this like hybrid world that you're talking about. Also all the art fairs, you know, were on view online viewing rooms and galleries and people have been like making it work. Um, but yeah, I just think that the pandemic was sort of like pushed us more into, do you think so? Like that the pandemic like pushed us more into that realm? I think what it's pushed us to is to understand that um, when you have physical space, ultimately the type of access is limited to a certain degree, right? It's, it's, it could be geographical, it could be, um, there could be a ticket price. Um, and, you know, I was, I was speaking with Simon that was so interesting at the new museum, we're working with a couple of uh, filmmakers who are very interested in Matterport, which is obviously taking a real estate application and really trying to rejig it and re-engineer it to be able to show exhibitions in a more engaging way. I'm pretty sure it's not the answer, but it's, but, you know, we're getting, we're getting closer. So I was certainly excited to see that you guys had also jumped onto it so quickly and that you're able to present um, exhibitions that, you know, unfortunately were only up for 10 days because of the way you guys wanted to um, uh, rearrange the, the thesis shows. So, um, so I do think uh, we're gonna have to think how to uh, develop more platforms where we can present work digitally. Though, you know, uh, again, being old school, being from Gen X, there's nothing that replaces uh, an in-person studio visit. I'm quite sure had I done the studio visits over Zoom, um, I would not understand the work as well. 
uh, and and certainly I don't think um, it would have translated. Uh, certainly, uh, I think several of the artists, uh, a Zoom studio visit would have weakened my perspective of what I thought they were doing versus being able to see it in person. So um, we're at the top of the hour. I'm sure everybody would like to go um, have their lunch. And again, I wanted to thank everybody uh, so much for uh, just doing the work you guys are doing. I'm excited to come back on Sunday. And again, you know, it, it was just, I can't tell you how uh, much I enjoyed uh, seeing Simon, Paulina, Cajuns, Maya, and Leo's work um, yesterday. It really made my week. Um, and um, I look forward to seeing folks on Sunday. Thank you so much, Karen. And thank you, everybody who joined us. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. We thank can... you so much, Karen. Thank and you. also, big shout out to Carlos, who's been supporting us throughout the entire semester. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Karen. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Noah, for bringing this forward. Thank you guys. Check out where we are. Thank you, Carlo. Whoa. Where are you? We're in my apartment. That's my Cindy Sherman. Check it out. <laughs> nice. Up, All right. Smart. All right, guys. All right, see you.